everyone, welcome to Metalnet. I'm very excited today to have my guest, Linda McDonald, who is from the Iron Maidens, but also of Phantom Blue, one of my absolute favorite bands of all time. How are you doing, Linda? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I imagine after all these years, meeting people who are still like, I need to talk to you about Phantom Blue must sometimes be <laughs> like, really? Like I've done a million things since then. Why Phantom Blue? But um, but I mean, that was such a big, I would imagine that was such a big part of, you know, kind of the early part of your musical career. Um, does it, does it surprise you how much interest people still have in that band? It does. It, it actually really touches my heart that people, you know, I, I mean, we formed in 1987, <laughs> been, oh my gosh. And the fact that there are still people now this, this many years down the road that actually still know about the band um that they actually they bring cds and albums and and photos to some of the maidens shows and um it's just an honor that that the music is still a part of their lives now so many years later so yeah I, i'm very flattered <laughs> well, I, I love hearing that. I really do because I'm such a huge fan. And I mean, I've always I've been a metalhead since '87. That was kind of the year I discovered like all my bands and all that. And um, Phantom Blue, I think I think you guys got signed maybe like '89 or so. And that's a I think I discovered you a little bit after that. And it was actually a pretty cool story because I was that girl that um, you know listened to found, went out of my way to find the girl bands and like the female led bands and all that stuff and so I actually had it was one of my female friends who was like oh there's this band um, do you know about them Phantom Blue and I actually hadn't heard of you quite yet and it was when the first album was out and she's like I think you're gonna love this so she gave it she gifted it to me and it has been like one of my favorite albums ever since I went to get built to perform like I think the day it came out, like I just couldn't wait, you know, I was so ready for it. Um, but I love that it was gifted to me by like another girl, you know what I mean? So that was what kind of made it even more special. So we're definitely going to talk about Phantom Blue today, but before we get there, um, I wanted to kind of learn about you as a musician and how you started out in your like super young days. Um, so I had, I've heard that you, before you were even a drummer, had played piano, guitar, and violin. So I was wondering, how, what did you start with and how old were you when you started playing? Uh, my first instrument was piano. Mm -hmm. And I think I was six when I started. And uh, I started playing because my sister was playing and it looked like a lot of fun and I loved what I was hearing. And so since she was going to lessons, my parents sent me lessons too. So I took some piano lessons um, from six years old through I think eighth grade. So it was something that you chose for yourself, not the something like your parents just decided, Linda, you're going to be a piano player. Correct. That's really cool. <laughs> so for you, because you chose it yourself, were you more disciplined, let's say, than the kid whose parents made them take piano lessons? You know, I was because I wanted to learn and I did my best, the best that I could. And I just had a problem understanding theory for some reason. I just, I wanted to just play by ear, you know, <laughs> but I tried. Um, it seemed to come more natural and easier to my sister, I think. Um, but I, I had to put more time into it. And I'm a Virgo and I'm very anal retentive and all the details. And <laughs> I, I feel so sorry for my parents, but at the same time, I'm so blessed that they were so patient because I, I know I'd be trying to learn it and playing. And anytime I'd make a mistake, it'd be like, bam, bam, bam on the keyboards. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's already competition. <laughs> That's not the best method to learn. <laughs> but I mean, you're a professional musician, so it, could, it couldn't have hurt the way, you, the way you went about it. Um, were you competitive with your sister at all, being that you were both learning the same instrument? No, no. Not at all. I was very inspired by her, and I just wanted to be as good as she was. <laughs> oh, amazing. That's amazing. So when did you pick up guitar and violin? Um, violin was because my sister played violin <laughs> in school. So after she was done playing it in school, I took it over and um, this was like in fourth grade, maybe fourth or fifth grade. So I just did it at, uh, in elementary school for one semester. Okay. But it, was, it was really fun. And since I already knew how to read music from piano, um, they had me doing the beginning and advanced class at the same time. Oh, nice. So that, 
I could learn, you know, the position on, on the uh, violin with my fingers and get used to that. But at the same time, I got to play with the school orchestra, the elementary school orchestra. And that was such a mind opening experience for me because you sat there and you would play the voice on, you know, I, I had the easiest parts. That's okay though, <laughs> on my end. And just hearing what each different instrument was doing and that whole collective outcome of the song with all those different instruments and voices just really struck me. And I was amazed. I would go home and I would sit at the piano and I would remember all the parts that I heard the different instruments doing somehow. <laughs> and um, I would pick them out on the piano and play the different parts. And I don't know, it was just fascinating to me. So I should have, but I didn't. Um, I guess <laughs> since you, piano, was it sort of like it was you at your piano playing mostly by yourself? And then this was like really the first time you were part yeah. of something bigger than yourself. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then guitar, was guitar right after that? Or was that guitar later down the road? Guitar was, I am I'm definitely not a guitar player, <laughs> <laughs> but I picked it up and I, I had a lot of fun with acoustic guitars doing, you know, finger picking stuff and, um, in junior college, I took uh, some classical guitar class and stuff like that, but I am not a guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was interesting and it was, uh, I totally respect guitar players a big time. I wish I was a guitar player, but it just doesn't work here and here and here for me. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so now most of this was in, I think, Montana, where you grew up. Is that right? Or did no, you, you didn't I, grow up there the whole time? I was only uh, about three years old. We moved out. Uh, my dad was an Air Force, Air Force guy. And um, so we moved a lot. And we moved from Montana when I was three to Los Angeles. And uh, we, we'd pretty much been in California from that point forward, so. Oh, so you were, you were is it fair to say you were raised around sort of that culture and not probably easier for you to go see bands and things like that when you were a teenager than it would be for, let's say if you had grown up in Montana or somewhere else? I guess, I, I guess so. I mean, I'm glad I grew up here in when I did in the time period because um, when I started to play and play out, um, I mean, it was the eighties. <laughs> wow yeah <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> definitely my favorite time period of all um so at some point you had a moment you had a special moment and it was actually because of your brother um who introduced you to maiden um tell me about that because i i believe <laughs> this was a big moment for you <laughs> like it was a big mistake my brother has a huge part to do with me actually pursuing drums and playing and everything because um, I'll back it up a little bit. Um, he got a guitar, an electric guitar, and he started playing and I wanted to play too. It's like my brothers and sisters always got the instruments first and I wanted to join in and I wanted to do it too because it just looks so fun. Um, so I seriously, I got my mom's Tupperware. <laughs> and, sat it out on the floor in, in his bedroom and he had his guitar and he would play and I had chopsticks and it's a true story. It sounds so silly, but um, <laughs> and a full coffee can that we put marbles and metal, you know, metal things inside. So when you hit it, it actually sounded like a snare drum. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have a kick drum, but I had a lot of, of Tupperware tom-toms <laughs> and a snare drum and we would kind of jam a little bit and but he encouraged me to go and get a real drum kit. How old were you at this point? I was 15. Okay. All right. So you heard he played some Maiden for you. You fell in love. You were watching um, him play. It was like a whole, whole bunch of things going on at your house. Um, yes, I was in, in school and um, I got sent home for an impromptu vacation for a few days. <laughs> <laughs> I got sent home. And there was nothing else to really do. My mom said, you know, no phone calls from friends, this and that. But it happened to be like the warmest days of the year. Mm -hmm. So my timing was very good on that part. <laughs> so <laughs> I laid out in the sun 
and I went in and um, took my brother's records and I found Made in Japan in mm. his record collection. I knew that I liked Maiden, but I'd not heard Made in Japan. So I put that on, lay down in the sun and and that's what happened. I just couldn't believe it was live. It was so tight. It was so energetic. And it just, it just pulled me in because um, as we know, in those days, it's not like making a record today or a live recording today. I mean, there's, there's minimal overdubbing. You, you, it was just, just a different process. Did that come out right? It was such a different process. <laughs> um, that was, that was captured. That wasn't gone back into the studio and, and redone for perfection. And it was just so insanely uh, alluring. That energy was just so magnetic. And the drumming, it just, it blew my mind because of that energy. And it was at that moment that I decided, yep, I think I, think I wanna play, like for real. I wanna play and I wanted to play with that kind of energy in a band with that kind of energy. and the way that Clive Burr was playing on that album. It's just, wow. That's totally where I was at in life at the time. It was like, Hurrah! <laughs> So you just knew, and you said, I think you had said that your brother lent you some money so that you could get, get your kit. Yeah, he did. He did. he did, and I paid back little by little, and you know, <laughs> and I, got, I got a kit. It was a, a Ludwig Blue, Vista Light. It was an Octoplus kit, so it was massive. It was like a 15-piece kit. <laughs> oh, well, you went for it. You didn't do the five piece. You just went. You were like, "I'm going to be a drummer. This is what I do." Well, there was a, a magazine, you know, a little uh, called the Recycler, and um, people were selling, you know, musical instruments for sale and stuff. And there was this ad for this 15-piece Ludwig kit um, for $400. Oh. So like, okay, let's go check it out. <laughs> we did, and it, it was pretty beat up. A um, couple of the toms were split up the side, but they were acrylic, so you could you could repair them. And I told the guy I only had 300, and he told me, just take what you want. So I took it all. <laughs> oh, well, of course you did. Why would, why would you leave any of it behind? Oh, that's amazing. Um, so you're, it seems like your siblings were like an inspiration and also very supportive. How did your fa- parents feel when you came home with the big old drum kit. Um, I am not sure how much they really knew what they were getting into with me on that. I think they were really hoping it was a passing phase, but you know, my brother was playing. Um, some of his friends were getting together and jamming and that kind of thing. And um, it was actually, I'm going on a little tangent here his friend in his band left his drum set at the house one time and so we set it up in his bedroom and I sat down behind it and I I played a beat I played uh living after midnight (laughs) and it felt so amazing (laughs) so yeah I think that my mom just thought it would be a passing phase the way that my brother was playing with you know the garage band type stuff and um that didn't happen the way that <laughs> she got her Tupperware back at least, right? She did. She did, and I never <laughs> broke ahead. <laughs> that's, that's perfect. All right. So at some point, you've got your jump kit now. You're you're already living in LA because you're growing up there. At some point, you start playing in bands. What was your first band that you joined um, after you started playing drums? It was a band called Andromeda, mm. and it was a three-piece female band. For some reason, I've always been in all female bands. You've been in more than anybody I can think of. Because <laughs> you've got Andromeda, you've got Phantom Blue, you've got the Iron Maidens, there's uh, the Aussie Tribute Band. That was all female, right? Yeah. yeah. Are there any others that I'm forgetting? <laughs> uh, I, I, well, I wasn't an official member, so no. I mean, okay. I, <laughs> that's funny I, though. I, most of them were all female. It just kind of worked that way. I don't know. It's so funny. So <laughs> while we're on the topic, did you, it was that a choice or it sounds like it just happened sort of. Well, when I first, um, when I got in my first band, uh, once again, I went to the recycler, that magazine. I mean, <laughs> there was no internet yet, right. you know, um, you had to actually go and look up ads and 
call people. You couldn't just send texts or emails. Mm -hmm. um, there was two girls that were looking for a drummer and into Zeppelin and, you know, the kind of stuff that I was into. So it just worked out. The other ads that didn't specifically say all female, whatever, it just didn't sound right. I mean, I don't know. I, I just kind of fell into it somehow. That's fine. Well, clearly it's worked out for you. Otherwise you wouldn't have stuck with it for <laughs> so many years yeah. of your career. So when I would say when I first started getting into bands was around the time you kind of started professionally with Phantom Blue. Um, I feel like a lot of the all female bands or female fronter bands were sometimes spoken about as if they were like a novelty or like not even, or just not given a respect, the full respect of like a band that was fully male or that. And I feel like it's become a celebration finally. Um, did you feel that way while you were playing or did it, did it not affect you as a musician, as somebody on stage? Um, back in those days, yeah, it, being in an all girl band was something that people just looked at as, oh my God, it's, it's so different. And they would, they would want to judge you harder. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of times with live shows, people would tell us that, you know, they'd, they'd be like all crossed arms saying, either you guys are going to suck or you're going to be really good. Mm -hmm. And with Phantom Blue and with the Iron Maidens, it's the same. It's, it's the same thing. Um, I, I don't know if they, they hold their expectation levels lower from the beginning, mm -hmm. which it's silly. It was back then, as we all know, and it, it is now because we're all just people that play musical instruments. And, right. you know, um, sometimes at shows, we had some problems in the Phantom Blue days. Um, like if we were an opening band or something, um, they wouldn't draw the curtains for us, yet they would for all the other bands. Um, until we brought in one of our, uh, my boyfriend at the time who was acting as the manager at that point, or maybe he wasn't even yet, he was pretending to be because we didn't have one. And he would just step up and, and call him out on it and bam, it was done. Mm. You know, or if there weren't enough microphones that were, you know, we need to get this stuff mic'd up, it wouldn't give us the time of day. And it was ridiculous. Um, we don't run into that so much anymore because, you know, there's a lot of women bands out there. There's a lot of bands that have women in those bands that even if it's not a, a full all female band. And it's, I think the playing field is just leveling out. It's, we're just musicians. It's, it doesn't matter if you're a guy or girl. Yeah, I mean, it's always been that way, but it, it just, it almost felt like if you guys would always be asked things like who are your influences and, you know, wanting to hear about the female influences, which, you know, which is nice to hear. It's nice to hear the Pat Benatars and Anna and Nancy Wilson's. I'm sure. But I, I always felt like there was a, like a little bit of a pushback from the female musicians because it, it was probably like the only question that you got asked over and over and over again. And without maybe those other questions that the male musicians were getting asked, you know? So it's, it's kind of nice to see, well, not kind of nice. It's great to see the celebration <laughs> of female musicians because now I feel like you're treated like musicians, but we could also talk about the girl thing and it's not like a, oh God, I'm going to box myself in even further, which is kind of how it felt. Uh, right. It's not like a boys club and a girls club anymore. Right. Right. So Andromeda um, came together and then at some point you moved, was Phantom Blue the very next band that you were in or were there a few, yeah. were there a few other bands in between? Okay. And it how was, did Phantom Blue come together? Um, before... Andromeda or before Andromeda, that same recycler magazine. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> nope, that magazine's still around or not anymore. <laughs> you should have framed at your house somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, I was looking for, for people to jam with still. And um, I saw an ad uh, that actually it was a female saying looking for female musicians again, right? Mm -hmm. um, into thrash metal, Metallica, Iron Maiden, blah, blah, blah. I've never, I, it's so hard in those days to find other females who played that were into that type of music. I mean, in my high school, there was only, there's a handful of us and you know, we were in that clique of metal chicks. And <laughs> I don't know, so I was, I was really thrilled and I was gonna, I circled the ad and I was gonna give her a call later that day. 
um, went out, came back home, and I had a message from a girl who called me, and it turned out to be Michelle, and that was her ad. So she already, she got my phone number from a mutual friend, Michael Rosenberg, mm -hmm. and that same day, we were going to connect with each other, and that's how we met, and you know, I went down, I met her, she, and she lived in a, a studio, a loft up above a liquor store or something. Her and her family are just so amazing, so supportive of her, and just, just so musical. Her dad was a drummer also. Oh. Yeah. But, um, so we jammed and that kind of stuff, and she was talking about wanting to move up to San Francisco mm -hmm. and get into the thrash scene up there. Um, but I really wasn't quite ready to do that. So we kind of parted ways. Um, I got into Andromeda. Um, after Andromeda split, I went, uh, I was in Guitar Center looking for, you know, new drum heads and whatnot. And I ran across Michelle. She was working there. She's oh. like, hey, how you doing? Like, oh, what's up? Are you playing with a band? And I told her I was actually looking for a new one. She's like, oh my god we're putting a new band together and it's it's like racer x you ever heard of racer x oh my god <laughs> but we just need a drummer are you interested I'm like, Shh, sign me up sign me up so that's how that happened <laughs> so michelle didn't end up going to san francisco then she no. stayed in la and then she did she already have the rest of the original lineup or most of the original lineup um the whole original lineup did she have a bass player yet um I think that they were still looking, I don't think that we had the bass player yet. Okay. But she said, you have to listen to this girl sing. Her name's Gigi. And she <laughs> uh, she called Gigi and she said, okay, don't answer your phone because I want Linda, she's, she's going to be our new drummer. I want her to hear your voice because she had a song playing on her outgoing message. So oh. don't answer my name. <laughs> so she called it back and then I heard Gigi's voice on her outgoing message. And it's like, oh my God, that's awesome. And, that's kind of how bands got together back in those days. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's amazing. So you guys made, uh, I mean, it was the original lineup was for the first album, which I absolutely loved. And then a slight change in lineup for the second album, right? Um, but you made two amazing albums together. But I feel like that moment in history where all the music I loved started being pushed away and this whole new things started coming in. I feel like that happened right as um, Built to Perform was supposed to, you know, blow everybody's mind and, you know, get the attention that it deserved. Um, what was happening during that time? How were you feeling it? Like, did you know it was happening? And did you feel that shift? Um, we definitely did. We definitely did. Um, we weren't getting the support in the US that we were from, um, Roadrunner, we were on Geffen here and they they pretty much shelved us. You know, they they said that they didn't know what to do with us. They didn't know how to promote us, blah, 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 whatever. Um, but thankfully we were signed to Roadrunner in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So they took really good care of us. We did tours, we did several European tours. Um, they did the MTV thing and all the major metal magazines. It was all them. Um, but then this whole, I remember we were playing, um, wow, I'm like, I remember we were playing at this club called, <laughs> <laughs> in the UK. Anyway, we were in the UK and I remember that we got, we heard the news that Kurt Cobain had passed mm -hmm. and it was that day forward, there was just this dark cloud. Um, I don't know, the, the whole music scene was changing and everything just changed, you know? And uh, there were people from Europe saying, you guys were just about to bust into, you were just about to bust out and and thrive and, you know, we felt it too, but it is what it is and it's what was meant to happen with us. So I'm grateful for every moment that we had. Yeah, I, I mean, you made two amazing um, albums and then, um, I feel like that's the moment where Phantom Blue <laughs> came, and I, I might be fast forwarding a little bit, 
But there was a point where you were the original, you were the only original member left in Phantom Blue, but Phantom Blue was still together. You guys were yeah. still playing and making albums. What, what made you to decide to keep going with Phantom Blue? And did you have the support of the original members? Um, you know, it was hard to let a good thing die, I guess. And it was a good thing. And, and a lot of the players that stepped in to carry forward were exceptional players and stuff. But at the end of the day, it was going a, a pretty much a different direction than what Phantom Blue started out as. And it, it just wasn't working out anymore. And it, it, it was just time to call it a day, I think. Was there, was there an exact, was there like a moment or something that happened where you thought, okay, now, now is the time to end it? Or did it just sort of fizzle little by little? You know, with each member change, each time it was, it was just a clear chip out of the stone saying, you know, do we, do we continue? Do we call it something else? Or, you know, why? It was just one step closer to realizing you're beating a dead horse and you just got to start with something new, with a whole new concept, whole new band, or just call it a day. And actually during that time period, um, I was I was just in a bad place emotionally, I think, and I was done. I was so, so tired of the music scene. I was tired of music that was happening at that time period. I, I just wasn't motivated anymore. And I actually took photos of my drum set and I was getting ready to sell it because I was done. And then we got a phone uh, uh, email and a, a promo package sent to us um, from Jonathan Layton, who was in an Iron Maiden tribute, uh, a co-ed Iron Maiden tribute, um, <laughs> saying that they love Phantom Blue and any time that they, you know, they might be able to open up for us, they would love to. And all the while I'm thinking, we don't have Phantom Blue Trust anymore, but, <laughs> <laughs> but well, not quite. It didn't not exist yet. Um, we were actually looking for a bass player at that time. Um, because we had an offer to go and do an East Coast run with Phantom Blue. And we didn't have a bass player. So we thought, hey, there's a female bass player in this Maiden tribute, mm -hmm. right? Any girl that can play Steve Harris parts, she can <laughs> play parts of Phantom Blue much easier because it's, you know, it's it's not a bunch of triplets and gallops and all that stuff. And so we went down and we checked them out. And um, it was Jen. Warren, who is the one that had the idea to put the Iron Maidens together. Um, their whole band was getting ready to split up and whatever, and they all wanted her to carry forward with her dream of putting a female version of an Iron Maiden tribute together. So instead of us recruiting their bass player, they recruited me <laughs> and Josephine, who was playing guitar for Phantom Blue at the time. That's so awesome. the tables were turned and my flame to perform was reignited. And um, there you go. At that time period too, I am just a babbling fool right now. <laughs> it's all good, it's all good. This is what I want to hear. Um, <laughs> that tour that we were gonna do in the East Coast was canceled suddenly and abruptly because 9-11 happened. So that was that time period. It was just a very, very <laughs> point well taken that it's just not meant to be anymore. It's like, you wanna go on tour to New York for the first time with this band? Well, look what just happened, you're not going. And you just met all these wonderful people who wanna do a Maiden tribute project, you know? I think it was time to shift gears a little bit. I didn't put my drum set up for sale. In fact, I went and I, I got a brand new DW kit instead. And <laughs> And 20 years later, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember when, um, you know, I was disappointed that the, you know, obviously you're always as a fan, you're like bummed when one of your fans ends or whatever. But I did, I did see that you were starting the Iron Maidens or that you guys had started the Iron Maidens together. And I, t I have to be honest with you, I figured you'd do that for a couple years and then start <laughs> the original band. Um, did you have any expectations whatsoever of the Iron Maidens being pretty much your life for at least 20 years now no no not at all I just thought it was something 
really fun. It would be super fun to do because, you know, Iron Maiden, Clyde Burr, Made in Japan is the whole reason that I decided to play drums. So learning the stuff was not an issue because I, <laughs> you already know it all in your head and your heart. Now it's just, you get to play this for people and people want to actually come and see it. Okay. Just thought, okay, it's something to do. Um, and at that time too, you know, there weren't a lot there wasn't a lot happening in the uh, original music scene so much. I think we were, everything was shifting and, you know, just the flavor of music in those days, the live scene wasn't so happening here with original bands, but people were going to see tribute bands and cover bands because they wanted to see and hear music that they were already familiar with. Mm -hmm. They wanted to have a good time. They didn't want to just sit there and hear people doing depressing, music, you know, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna go and kill myself here because it's so depressing. They wanted to go and have good it time. Good vibe. Yeah, it was a totally different vibe what came after the 80s music. The 80s was, I think, about partying and celebration. And yeah, I mean, coming out of it, going um, with Poison and all those happy bands that, you know, good time, <laughs> not but a good time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it's, it sounds like it, like when you started the Iron Maidens, it was like a nice restart for you. People yeah. were interested in coming. Um, yeah. Did you guys, so did you guys get a good reception overall? And um, did it feel like, okay, we'll do this for a little while? Um, we did. We always meant to be short term. Um, you know, I, nobody really planned like, okay, we're going to be doing this for X amount of years. It was just something that was really fun. And it's like, let's, let's just, let's see where it goes next. You know, like the very first rehearsal that we had, um, we knew that something was up because we, we were jamming in a, a rented rehearsal space and suddenly people were peeking in the little, the square window, like, what's going on what's going on in there and and people were outside in the hallway peeking in the room trying to see what was going on in there so we knew something it, it was going to be received better than we anticipated because we were just having fun mm -hmm. um and the first show we did was at a club called Paladinos that uh, Jimmy D took the chance and went ahead and booked us there for our first gig and the line was out around the building down the street and it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. It was so fun. It was, it was just mind boggling, but you know, we're grateful to this very day. <laughs> so I'm curious, what is it that made you continue? Like, so let's say you're, a, you're in the band, it's going well, people love you. You're having a great time. A year goes by, two years goes by, three years goes by. <laughs> What's happening in the Iron Maidens where you're where you're feeling like I want to keep doing this um, versus starting another original band where you could write your own music or play your own music or you know go the route that you went earlier in your career? Well, um, just as time passed, we started to suddenly get offers to go, and our first out of state shows were in the Washington State area, the Pacific Northwest. So we went up there for a couple of weeks and just drove all over the place there, but it was so fun. <laughs> it was so fun. Um, and we just, we just started getting offers to do these really fun shows and they just got better and better and better and more interesting. And then, you know, suddenly we're getting offers to go to South America, um, go to Europe, um, I don't know why. Why should we hop off that horse? Why? Why should we stop? I mean, people want to want to hear it. I mean, they have. I mean, sure, Maiden themselves are touring, but they can't be everywhere at one time. And you know, they don't play. They, they've got such an extensive catalog of songs that there's no way they can play all of it. So mm -hmm. we like to just kind of give a little surrogate Maiden fix. <laughs> Love it. And, <laughs> how did Maiden um how did Maiden take to you guys uh especially in the early days when you first started um I heard that they were intrigued <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> so we actually um oh this is so funny it's kind of embarrassing but it's really funny we had little uh 
little gift bags <laughs> made with little cookies and things like that in them. And uh, we had a little demo that we did and we stuck a copy in each, each bag, one for each um, member. And Michael Kenny, who is their keyboard player and also text for Steve Harris, made an arrangement when they were playing at Irvine Meadows. So after the show, we went backstage and he brought each of the band members out to meet their female counterparts. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> and we did a little gift bag. Like, Here's your gift bag. <laughs> yeah, it's so silly, but it was so much like, Christmas ever, you know, it was, you know, you get starstruck and all nervous and. <laughs> so this was that the first time you met them? Like you never um, played with them with Phantom Blue or open for them or anything like that? Oh, no. Okay. No. No, but I, we met, like, uh, I met Clive Burr at the airport um, when Phantom Blue did our first tour in 89. Um, I, had a, I had been making a joke the whole time. I don't know. I, I just amused myself that way. <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, kept telling everyone, you know, they're like, how does, it, how does it feel being here on your first European tour? And she said, oh, I'm just here because I want to meet Clive Burr. <laughs> I'm going to find Clive Burr in the UK. And I'm going to meet him. Yeah. whatever so after the tour was done it was like a six or seven maybe even an eight week tour it was a long tour and um, we were back at Heathrow and we were waiting for our plane and all of a sudden over the loudspeaker they paged Clive Burr Stop. will you please come to gate blah 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 and uh, I just looked at Michelle like, oh my god did you hear that <laughs> we took off and there he was that's amazing <laughs> I got to meet him and I got to uh, tell him that because of him, I play and to thank him for inspiring me. And, and Michelle brought one of our albums um, intending for me to give it to him. And I was just so, uh, I had him sign it and I took it back. <laughs> that sounds like something I would do by accident. Like I'd get home and be like, wait. <laughs> yeah, so I still have it. Like that. <laughs> That's amazing. That's wonderful. Well, you so you're about to celebrate your 20th year. I think you were saying in October it'll be your official 20th anniversary um, for the Iron Maidens. Um, are you guys planning on doing anything to commemorate that year? I know it's tough with you know COVID and with everybody um, being separated. But is there is there something that you guys are planning to commemorate two decades together? Well, you know we want to, but it's is is anything able to happen you know I mean at least we're getting some shows booked now that mm -hmm. you know a few of them are going to stick but I'm not really sure it, it, I'm trying to brainstorm to to just you know have something even if it's just like a, a little patch or some some merch item or something that that would commemorate the 20 years mm -hmm. but I'm not sure I mean or release a little uh, EP or something, you know, yeah. we're not really sure. We, we still have a little time. <laughs> yeah, you do. Actually, you do. And by then things might be very different for us. So yeah. it's hard to tell. And October, I mean, I guess technically it goes from this coming October into next October. Yeah, I mean, so. you do have a whole year. You have a whole year once October hits. So. Yeah. So maybe we'll, we'll get some tours in place and we can do it the 20th anniversary tour and have a special set list or, you know, who knows? Yeah, you should do something. You should do something big because that's pretty. That's pretty major for any. You can major. send requests. You can send suggestions to our. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. Well, how how has it been for you guys? Because um, you are playing someone else's music, so it's not like you guys can even get together on Zoom and say, "Hey, we're going to write a bunch of songs for the Iron Maidens." So, is there anything that you guys can do to stay connected to one another um, as a band, or is it kind of like? just waiting for that moment where you can rehearse that you could do a show here or there? Um, well, musically, everyone's just kind of doing their own thing right now. Cause as you said, it's a tribute band. So we don't have to write new material for it. <laughs> <laughs> everyone just does their homework. And, you know, over this time period, we selected about seven songs that we've not played before. And so everyone's learning those. So at least there'll be some new songs that we haven't played with this lineup to add-ins for for places that we've already played before you know 
Um, I know Nikki's working on her solo stuff. Um, she put out an EP and she's working on a full length CD of her original stuff. And Courtney is putting out, um, I'm not sure if it's gonna be an EP or a full length, but um, she's working on original stuff and it's sick. <laughs> It's it's some hardcore thrash stuff. It's 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 really heavy, but it's very technical and it's like it's whew, can't wait. <laughs> um, uh, so COVID aside, um, wait, I know it's hard to say because we've just done a whole year of social distancing and that. But COVID aside, do you feel like being um, in the Iron Maidens has somewhat protected you from like the changes in the music industry? Meaning you're not putting out, you're not having to write albums or wait for them to do, you know, sell so many copies and that you're really just going out there and putting on an amazing show for people who are coming because they, they know the songs, they love the songs and they love the way you guys play them. So does that protect you somehow from all the changes um, that are happening in the industry? Or do you feel like you've been affected by it as well? Um, you know, not being able to get like a huge record deal or, you know, being catered to by a record company and that sort of thing. You know, um, I think for, well, for me personally, mm -hmm. I'm enjoying this a lot um, mm -hmm. because when we were, when we were doing the Phantom Blue thing, you know, we, uh, we wanted to get a record deal and all that. And we got signed to Shrapnel, <clears throat> which was fantastic. You know, we got our first album out and all that stuff we did, but then we got, um, we got bought out and signed to Geffen Records, which at the time was one of the biggest uh, major labels that that a band in that genre, in the hard rock genre, could be signed on. And it was like a nightmare. So I don't give a rat's ass about major labels or label record label deals anymore. If I was doing original stuff, it's this day and age, you can do it yourself. Yeah. And you can make more for you can actually make a living for yourself instead of for the record company. So, you know, I don't know if that answers your question or no, not. Yeah, it's, it sounds like either, either way, even if you were making, do you feel like even if you were making original music that you still have a better chance because you're not having to maybe wait on somebody or share your profits with another person or- I think so. Kind of red tape and all that. I think so. And, you know, people can get so connected through the internet these days that you don't need to go through and have this record label be the dictator of you know what you're going to sound like mm -hmm. um, when you're going to uh, have things released or you know you can just be you it's I think it's more spiritually and soulfully satisfying mm -hmm. to be able to release material that is you um, instead of what they want and when you know, like with the Phantom Blue stuff, we we had a great album we thought with Built to Perform with Max Norman. Mm. Um, Max Norman on Time to Run, the song, he spent so long mixing that one song and it was absolutely mind blowing. And our a &R guy, uh, uh, I'll just say that the label heard it and said, oh, that's not the direction we wanna go with it. Mm. He spent weeks on one song and it was, a, we thought it was a masterpiece. <laughs> um, he did too, he was so disappointed with that. Um, it's like, well then why did you hire me? Because that, you know, he mixed it the way Max Norman would mix it. Right. And it was, it was exactly what we wanted. Nope, you have to pull the vocals back. We want the vocals to be buried. And <laughs> what? why would you want Gigi's voice to be buried? I don't know. It's those kind of controlling things that, you know, people don't have to deal with anymore these days. But people are so connected. I'll go back to what I was getting at um, online that, you know, to get music, original music and stuff on soundtracks or movies or commercials, you don't need a major label for that. Mm -hmm. You know, people know people who who will get your music out and whatnot. And I just, I think it's time for, it's the right time to just, just do it yourself. That's awesome. Yep. So yep. <laughs> what, do, what do you see for yourself as a musician? Um, aside from your band, what do you see for yourself? I'm guessing more Maidens, but do you see any projects, solo projects, um, 
Linda McDonald's album or new bands or anything coming your way? I don't know. You know, I'm open to to anything, really. Um, I just did a couple of tracks to contribute to an album that I guess I'm, I can't say it yet because it's not out yet, but um, <laughs> a couple of tracks and on a, a songwriter's album who who wrote a lot of the songs that were a big part of my life uh, when I was growing up. So I was really excited to get the opportunity to do that. It's amazing. There's stuff. So, you know, I, I'm just working on my own playing and, and getting my technique better and just having fun and just playing whatever, wherever. It's yeah. On. <laughs> Waiting to <laughs> <take> those again. <laughs> yeah. So I have uh, two more questions for you. And uh, my last two questions are, what is your advice for drummers specifically? Um, anything that, that you know, whether it's, it could be like nerdy tech technique stuff, or it could just be like general. <laughs> um, and then what is your advice for musicians for this new landscape? Well, um, for drummers, I will say, learn more than just one style. You know, um, I guess it goes for both musicians in general too, you know, um, as well as just for, for drumming. Um, pay attention to your technique because later in life, you know, if you start playing slouching over this way, it's fine when you're really young, but you get a little older and, you know, you, <laughs> like right now I'm dealing with a little bit of a shoulder, shoulder thing and they're telling me that my shoulder actually is curved forward a little and my spine has a twist and they couldn't figure out why. And I told them, well, this is how I sat for like 30 some years mm -hmm. and it's totally it. So mind your posture, <laughs> you know, all that stuff, learn your, uh, learn the basics. It's boring, but um, learn the basics. Um, try maybe in school, try, try the drum line. That's one regret that I have that I never did that. Mm -hmm. I wish that I did, but um, I wasn't, a big fan of high school and anything to do with school that it's just such an institution I couldn't stand it <laughs> but I wish I did and you know don't be afraid to try try new styles and go and jam with people okay. who cares who cares if you make mistakes just it's easier said than done because you know it's never easy when someone looks at you like what are you doing what are you playing you just blow it off and you know smile and just learn not to do that again and <laughs> just, just have fun with it enjoy it and take every opportunity you can as long as it's a good one that's awesome well thank you so much for being a guest um it's been a pleasure to talk to you and to learn you know a little bit more about you and your playing and your career and i am looking forward to the day hopefully in the not too distant future where we could go to shows again and get to see yeah. you play. Um, Cause it sounds like you're playing absolutely everywhere when you're on tour. Yeah, last year, oh my gosh, we had so many tours. We had so many shows set up. It was pretty crazy actually. Pretty much there was gonna be a suitcase in the living room at all times, you know, mm -hmm. that's what it was gonna be. But I'm not gonna complain. I'm not gonna complain about it. Yeah. Well, enjoy but your I, home because I'm moving the year off right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, so anyway, thank you again for being um, a guest on the show. And thank you'll have you. to come back again. You'll have to come back again and tell tell us what you're up to. Absolutely. <laughs>